Good morning, everyone. Good morning, my wonderful, wonderful students. Today is the 24th day of November 2022, and we are continuing our lectures on Nigerian Petroleum Law. My daughter, please come forward so that I will save my strength. I have another class after me. We will be continuing our focus on uh, concessions that are awarded to oil companies, upstream concessions awarded to oil companies in the great country of Nigeria. And for that, we have been focusing on part two, parts one and two of chapter two of the act. Part one and part two of chapter two of the act, which deal with administration, general administration first, and then administration of upstream petroleum operations and environment. We'll talk about environment sets and subsequently. That has been our focus. Later on, maybe in second semester, when we focus on downstream, we will look at uh, general administration of midstream and downstream petroleum operations as contained in uh, part three. Is that okay? Yes. Of that same chapter two. So you see that the act, like you already know, is divided into five major parts. And then uh, part one generally deals with governance and the commission, the authority, the minister of petroleum, the place of NNPC, and uh, all that. But what will now come to this chapter two? Chapter two forms the crux of the uh, of what? Are you for this class? Yeah. And you are coming late. It's well with you, my daughter. Just sit down, eh? Okay, so part one and uh, part two, please focus. Now, uh, of this chapter two, deal with upstream. Why part three of chapter two deals with downstream? Part four deals with, uh, I mean, part three of chapter two deals with midstream and downstream. While uh, part four deals with administration of midstream and downstream gas operations. Are you with me? Yes. Uh, you will discover in the course of our study that there has been serious, serious focus on gas. I've explained that again and again. What did I say about gas in relation to Nigeria? You hear me? I said that Nigeria is largely a gas province with a little what? Oil. oil. You know, but we have not focused on gas in the past. But now we are seriously focusing on gas. One reason is because uh, the world is moving towards cleaner oils. Did I say that? Yes. Yes, and it is believed widely that gas is cleaner than crude oil. You get me are you with me? Yes. And secondly, we are very, very rich in gas. So we are beginning to put in place a lot of measures to uh, develop our gas uh, resources. Is that okay? Yes, so you will see that from part 3 down to actually part uh, 7 coming, they deal with gas, I mean they deal with midstream and then downstream operations as the case may be. While chapter 3 now deals with those communities and chapter 4 deals with taxation and all that. So let's continue from where we stop and see how far God will help us today. We will be looking at yesterday when the bridge stop. We looked at the bidding process. Is that not so? Yes. Yes, and uh, we emphasize the fact that everything now must be done transparently and uh, publicly. And after the bidding process is is uh, completed, the commission will make a recommendation to the minister. Of petroleum who acting upon that uh, are you are you happy my daughter you don't look happy at all eh? <laughs> I have no problems good and so after the commission 
is through with this bidding process, the Commission will recommend to the Minister. So what has happened here is that the Minister of Petroleum has lost the powers that he or she used to have. Are you with me? He or she now has to rely significantly on the Commission. Before this time, uh, we had DPR group that did not even have any legislative backing. Francis, you are coming later. I'm in the class, you are coming. Because you are paying my salary. Thank you. Most of you have not paid school fees here. Who has not paid school fees here? Have you paid the game? If not, 22,000 students, only 3,900 have paid school fees. How do you want the school to run? And on top of that, you're even coming late. Well, it's well known. Can we continue? Yes. So after this process is, is done now, under this new regime, you now recommend to the uh, minister who mustn't comply with your recommendation, but if he doesn't, he must justify it. I have explained that again and again. Is that not so? Yes. He must justify. And that, if he's not justified, he can be challenged. He must give reasons. So there must be reasonable grounds upon which you can reject. Um, but ultimately, it is left at the realm of politics. The decision to grant is a political decision. Is that not so? Yes. It is a political decision because the minister is a politician appointed I am by the president, you know, so they will consider political considerations in addition to uh, technical considerations. So the role of the commission in this case is the, the commission is a technical expert. Are you with me? They will do the bid evaluation and apply all their resources and capabilities to determine whether company A is more suitable to be granted this uh, oil block and they will use an objective bid criteria. That's why I say there must be bid parameters. It could be single bid parameter or it could be a combination of parameters. Did I point that out yesterday? Did I point that out yesterday? I did. It could be a single bid criteria. And we could look at your royalty yeah. Yeah, and all that. Or we could combine all of them and score you points. Did I point that out? Yes. And so the company with the highest points will automatically be the winner. And if the minister does not reject this uh, recommendation, I think within 60 days, to be deemed to have been uh, granted. Is this 60 days I said? Yes. Excellent. And I also look at exemption, exceptions to the bidding rule. Exceptions to the bidding rule. Like in certain instances, an oil block may be granted to an oil company without an auctioning process. And I gave you like five of those examples. You can make tell me one of them. Okay, the examples of exceptions to the bidding rule where you can grant an oil block without a bid. You were not in this class yesterday. Oh, you can sit down. And you did not get the video on the audio. No problem. Any other person can help us? That's my young daughter. Yes, help us. What are the exceptions I gave? Don't worry, don't worry, it's more small. Eh? Are you hearing? Small small. What I would advise you to do after I get the audio so that you listen to it. It's a little bit abstract. You know, I said that the, generally you can't grant an uh, oil block or a petroleum block, but we are used to oil blocks, so let's use oil block. You can't grant an oil block to a company unless you do a transparent, open, competitive bidding process. Go through an issue of licensing round and call these companies to compete among themselves. However, there are exceptional instances. One of which, for example, is if there is a bilateral or a multilateral agreement between Nigeria and another country. The federal government of Nigeria may direct the Minister of Petroleum to give an oil block to a company from that country. If, as a result of that uh, treaty, Nigeria is going to benefit immensely. And I gave you a good example that in China, China is very good in building infrastructure. Is that not so? Yes. And so China may come to build an airport for us or a super highway from Calabar to Lagos. I use that example. Is that not so? Yes. yes, that will solve a lot of our transport problems. And so in response, Nigeria can now agree to give China an oil block. So that is one example. Another example I gave you that a PEL holder, petroleum exploration license holder, who after the course of his, his exploration has now discovered some oil, can now go to the commission and say, please give me a PPL 
as a result of my reward for my years of exploration. In giving that company the PPL, you will not conduct a bid. The same example follows for uh, a PPL that is now being converted to a what? Yeah. PML, excellent. So if you have now been able to make a commercial discovery, as the case may be, you now approach the and commission again, they would also not have to conduct a bid round in granting you that license, that uh, lease. And lastly, I said an OML holder, OML under the Petroleum Act regime that who decides now to convert to a PPL or a PML. Are you with me? I told us that it is now possible for you having an OML to convert it to a PML. You understand? And if you go to the commission, the commission will say, no problem, I will help you and convert. Because if you convert from OML to PM, PPML, you have some tax relief. There are some benefits that companies enjoy now that companies did not enjoy then. But that you are an OML holder does not automatically entitle you to these benefits. You have to convert your OML to a PML. If you want to convert, the commission may say, okay, you have a 300 uh, square, kilometer, square kilometer of land, but before you convert, you have to relinquish some. Are you with me? Okay, so give us back 50% and the remaining 50% convert it to a PML. In doing that conversion, you will also not do a bid round. I said all that, didn't I? Yes. Good, so. Now, one of the things they do before they conduct this bid, bid before they go through this bidding process, one of the things they come, this commission will do, it is mandated to do, is to issue what they call licensing uh, guidelines. What is it called? Licensing. licensing guidelines. Yeah, licensing round guidelines. So let me give this section. So, it's a second. So basically, it's a guideline that must be published so that any company that wants to bid for that uh, oil block will know what to expect. You cannot just do it. Uh, so these are guidelines that govern the process of issuing licenses or leases. They are guidelines that are established by the Commission to govern the process of issuing a license or a lease. So they are made in post ones to section 73 uh, and 75 and 76, 73, 75, 76. Okay. So generally they will they will have some uh, some clauses. Some of the clauses you could see in that guideline will include the acreage, A C C R E A G E, the acreages that are up for auction, the term and minimum work obligations that they expect you to meet. Are you with me? So the term will be ten years, twenty years. Uh, we're auctioning this um this license or this lease for 20 years and any company that is going to bid must be ready to meet a minimum criteria. Is that okay? Yes. Sir. Yes, minimum uh, work obligations and it will also contain the requirements or the obligations the bidder must fulfill. Another one is the pre-qualification criteria, the bid parameter, the list of required documents that you submit, so don't worry, I'll give you my slides and you also get my audio from your notes. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, I'm just trying to run through them. And it will also contain the criteria for evaluation of your technical capacity. And it will have the requirement for financial competence. You know, financial competence among others. So these are some of the things that will contain. Then also, Section 76 of the Act also mandates mandates the commission to issue what they call model licenses and model leases. A model license is, is a document that is published maybe on the website containing maybe 98% of all that the company will be required to you know uh, contract. So a lease is a contract. You are bidding for a lease. 
or a license. You want to know the terms before you commit your funds to um, bidding. Is that not so? Are, are you with me? So the people calling you to bid are now giving you a model that should you win this bid process, should you uh, uh, emerge as one, as, one of the, as one of the winners, these are what this is these are the terms of what this lease is going to contain so it's called a model lease or a model license so please i want you to it's a short term assignment visit the website please visit the website of the nigerian option regulatory commission and see if you can get a model license a model license And a model leaves. DPR used to issue them, so check for that and then revert back when we meet again. Thank you, Father. Can we continue? Yes, sir. Good. So again, what will the uh, model license or leads contain? I'll just run through some of them. It, it's a model. It's not the when the concession is granted to you, the commission can vary from it. It's just a model, so they can add some clauses, they can remove some clauses. But on the whole, this is what you will expect. You know, so to contain it, to describe the average, it will describe the terms again, the minimum work program, the minimum level of investment that will be expected from you, details of guarantees you'll be required to provide, dispute resolution uh, and mechanisms in case there's dispute, and uh, do we go to arbitration, mediation, conciliation, or do we rely on what they call expert determination and applicable uh, sanctions? So these are some of what is it? So look at section 76, then also com compare 76 with 85. 85 also, the model license may also uh, have provisions with, with relation to uh, fiscal obligation. Fiscal is F I S C A L, such as fees, rents, and royalties, and all that. So please uh, look it up, compare section. And uh, 76 to 85, and all that. But that is not our focus for today. And today I want us to look at when the concession has been granted to you as a company, definitely you are not expected to start to work. Is that not so? To so produce this oil, and uh, in carrying out this work, you'll be required to comply with a barrage of obligations, like I said, there will be minimum work obligations, and then there will be environmental requirements, there will also be local content obligations, and then financial obligations as well. The company will be required to comply with all of these, and to make regular re reports to the Federal Government of Nigeria through the Commission. But at some point in time, it is possible that the company may choose to merge, two, two oil companies may choose to merge. Secondly, a company can decide to transfer its assets to another company. Are you with me? Yes, so you may decide to sell your interest. They call it divestment. So a company can decide to divest. Either they want to focus on a, a particular block, or they want to leave the country, or for whatever reason. You know, one of the things the law has done with respect to petroleum concession is to stipulate that such sit up work, such uh, transactions cannot be con concluded without the consent of the Minister of Petroleum, generally. Remember that you cannot get this license without the Minister. And again, you cannot sell your interest without the consent of the minister. Is that okay? Yes. That, I believe, should draw your mind uh, to the Land Use Act 
where you cannot sell your landed property without the, the what? Yeah, without the governor's consent because all lands are vested in the governor who holds them on trust and all that. So that same concept somehow is brought here that before you sell or you transfer or two oil companies even merge together, you must approach the uh, minister to grant consent. But if it's a petroleum exploration license, it's a PEL, you can transfer it, you can sell it, but you will need the consent of the commission, not the minister. Remember, it's the commission that grants the PEL, not the minister. The minister can revoke it, but the minister doesn't grant it. And the commission is the entity that has responsibility for granting consent for the transfer of the PEL. But for the PPL and PML, you must go to the minister. Again, the commission must recommend it. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So you have it, you have two hurdles to cross. First of all, you must satisfy the commission, which will now give a recommendation. On top of that, you now approach the minister. Because for the government, one of the concerns will be that uh, if you are selling your oil block, who are you selling it to? You know, who are you selling it to? The, the prospective purchaser must be agreeable to the government. Is that not so? Yes. Is that not so? Yes. yes. Under the old regime, the petroleum act regime, which, like I said, is fading away now. Uh, before granting consent, the minister would also want to be sure that the company you are granting that selling your lease or your license to is not from a country that does not extend the same privileges to Nigeria. Are you lying with me? So let's assume Kuwait doesn't give oil blocks to Nigerians. You don't, if you say you are a Nigerian, you want to bid for a block, you don't want to hear. If Kuwait cannot, so it's what they call a reciprocity. You understand? If Kuwait now cannot come to Nigeria, have an oil company and say, I want to bid for oil block. Sorry, sir. So what your country does is not affecting you. So those are some of the criteria. So before the minister will grant this consent, he will look at your capacity and uh, he will look at your, your, your experience. Is that not so? Yes, your financial records, your technical capacity. The same, most of the same criteria that you use to determine when to award the license will also be brought to bear here in determining whether or not to approve the consent. So you see section 98, please. Oh, glory. Thank you, Father. I give you praise. Okay. No, did I say 98? Yes, sir. No, 95. Big 95. Okay. So generally there's a prohibition, do not transfer, do not novate, do not assign your concession or any rights, power or interest in it. Don't. Don't even say I'm, I'm, I'm transferring 3% or 5%. Are you with me? Yes. Before you do that, if you are going to transfer, you must go to the minister and seek his consent. Now, there are two things you need to... Where is that pen? Did I come with that? Do you have that pen you used to write? Please, if you do, I have so much of it in my office. I think I can it. Okay. Oh, I think I did come in. Thank you. So we want to be sure of two things. First of all, when we are looking at an oil block, an oil license, remember I told you that the concession is usually not granted to a person. You can't grant an oil block to a person. And so even though the layman can say he owns an oil block, and sometimes we use it loosely, technically speaking, whenever we refer to his, actually referring to the company, it's. Are you with me? Yes. Sir. Yeah, so we now have an oil company, um, Monikuno. On that strict corporate law principle or theory, this company is a separate single entity 
And so it is separate from the uh, shareholders. We used to have one man called Lulu Briggs. He has gone to the great beyond. And we'll all go there one day. And then uh, I think his wife, let's assume his son, Dumo Briggs. Are you with me? Yes. Let's assume there are two shareholders. Now we have this OML. They used to have an OML. When, uh, let's say when we were 34, it was an offshore concession. In granting the license, generally we will consider not just this company, we will have to disregard the personality of the company to also look at the persons behind. So we are not just dealing with Monifuno, we are also dealing with. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. So the Minister of Petroleum does not just look at money flow. He also looks at these persons. And so if at some point, Lulu Briggs and Dumo Briggs, you know what they have in this company is shares. Say it with me. Shares. Shares. The capital of this company is divided into shares. So if at any point in time, Lulu Briggs now assigns or transfers Let's assume he owns 98% 90, of the shares. Assigns his shares to my daughter, the you Good. If he's going to sell his shares in this company to this young lady, Monopolo remains unaffected. Its asset remains unaffected. What has changed hands here is what the shares, not the assets. So the general company law theory says it's not your business what happens among the shareholders. Shares can be sold at any point in time. Don't worry, as long as money follow on. But when we come to petroleum law, we disregard that. Are you with me? Yes. We disregard the corporate personality theory to say that if at any point in time Lou Briggs is selling his shares to a door to, to an extent that will give her control over this company. Our control over this company will invariably have an impact on who has control over this asset. And so she still has to go to the Minister of Petroleum to obtain what consent. Yes, my son. What if the share of the little bit is disregarded? Are there punishments like? He cannot, even if the minister will not consent, if the minister does not consent, the shares they are sold to a lot will be deemed not to have been sold. Are you with me? Yes. yes. And if it continues, it can be a ground for revocation. For revocation. So, yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. So, in terms of conflicting laws, the corporate laws that No, 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 no. There is no that company law principle has now been brought subjected as far as oil and gas is concerned, to petroleum law, you understand? So we have the general, even in Kama, we we'll look at it second in year, year five, even in Kama, there are a lot of exceptions to this general company law principle of separate and personality. Sir, yes, my dear, please. Uh, the, the, the company, mm -hmm. like when all of this becomes applicable, is it when um, he has not Applied is it before he applies for the OML or when he already has got India? It's when he has already got the OML. Okay, he's producing. Yes, let's see. As you militants are disturbing him, damaging all his pipelines. So, what am I wasting my time in Nigeria? I can go to Ghana, I can go to Equatorial Guinea. The tax regime there is even smaller. They have lights, they have infrastructure. I beg, let me move. And so, you want to move. But you have already invested so much in this uh, asset. So they look for a company to sell. Because that's actually what has been happening uh, for some time. Between 1956, when we discovered oil in commercial quantity. Where was it discovered in commercial quantity? That my daughter. What's your name? Kuro. Kuro. Yes, where was oil discovered? Excellent. So when we discovered oil between 56 and 1987, alone at 31 years, we never had any indigenous player in the oil and gas industry. All the companies that were operating upstream were foreign. 
you know, but in 1987 we had the first Dugri oil. Then from 1990, 1991, we began to have some indigenous companies like Corn Oil and Monopulo, and uh, a number of these companies began to rise. Today we have quite a number of them. We have Seplats. You've heard of Seplats, yes. and quite a number of them. So one of the things these indigenous companies have sought to do is to acquire assets of these international oil companies. Are you with me? Yes. yes. And so a number of these international oil companies are beginning to divest from Nigeria. One reason is insecurity. Then um, persistent damage of their infrastructure. Another reason is environmental obligations. You will discover when we talk about environmental law as it relates to the oil and gas industry that of late, local lawyers have been very, very successful against international oil companies. In the past, it was almost impossible to win a case against them. You know, but in the past 20 years, things have started changing. The courts have also taken a firm stance against them. They have broadened the local, local standing rule. And so people are beginning to successfully win cases against these oil companies. What some of them have now sought to do is to avoid these liabilities that continue to mount by divesting. Are you with me? Yes. Who are they divesting to? Most of them are divesting to local players, Nigerian companies. They are divesting and selling their shares. So we now have a lot of companies like ND Western and Setlat. Most of these people are coming together, some two, three, four companies are coming together to buy assets from international oil companies. Are you with me so far? Yes. Sorry, yes, my daughter. Yes. Does this have to do with joint venture contracts? No, my dear. No, my dear. A joint venture occurs when you have already been given, two companies are given an oil block to go and then uh, produce the oil that is located there. And so it is a venture, I'll, I'll still talk about it, joint venture PSCs, and that should be probably the next topic I will, uh, I will look at. But joint venture is different. Here we are saying that you have an oil block and you are selling it. Or two of you are given an oil block and you want to sell your own uh, share. Are you with me? Yes. Because most of the oil companies operating in Nigeria, there are two, there are different ways through which you can operate. Number one, you can develop your resource through a collaborative approach. Collaborative. And it is under this collaborative heading that we now have the JV, Joint Venture, PSE, Production Sharing Contract, and uh, SRO, Service, SC, Service Contract, and RO, SC, Risk Service Contract. Those are collaborations. The other option is SRO, sole risk. You are giving everything 100%, you bear all the obligations, you bear all the risk, you take all the profits. But most of them are collaborative. Are you with me? And these collaborations, about 80% of these collaborations are with NNPC. NNPC. So we have these uh, international oil companies that are collaborating with NNPC. And OML is given, for example, OML 11 that was as in Ogoni was given to NNPC and Shell. But the people say Shell should not produce oil there because they cost Wahala and that led to the death of Kensa Rugua. So Shell has not been able to produce there. Now Shell has relinquished it. Are you with me? They have given it back to NPDC. Those are some of the things that happen. But here we are looking at a case whereby your interest in an oil block, you want to sell it. Either because you are the sole risk owner or because you are a joint venture or PSC owner. You have a stake in it. You want to sell it for some uh, reason. Is that okay? Yes, sir. And the law is saying that uh, for you to do that, you need to get the permission of the government. You need permission of the uh, government. Can we continue, please? Thank you. I 
slide is 57 slides now. I will send it to you when I reach 100. I'm working on it. I'm cooking the food. Yes, my son, Francis. No, the company remains as it is. You understand? Nothing is affected. That what we are saying. What is only affected is that your the ownership of the shares has uh, moved hands. But but petroleum law knows that when there is a change in shareholder, it can affect because the person the company. That's why I'm saying that for petroleum law, we not just look at the company. We also look at the persons behind the company. So the company must be acceptable to us. The persons behind the company must be acceptable to us. And so you cannot say I've sold the shares. And who are you selling it to? If you don't like the person, then you cannot force that person on us. Are you with me? Good. Let's move on. So basically what I'm re-emphasizing that a company cannot transfer, innovate, or assign its concession or any right, power, or interest in it without the consent, written consent of the minister. Also, for this purpose, for the purpose of assignment, listen up, a change of control in a concession shall, for the purpose of consent, be deemed to be an assignment of the concession. So if you change the control, Monipulo had 97%. Definitely was a controlling shareholder. The moment he changes control to a dot, we are saying you have assigned that concession. You must come and take cons uh, our consent. If he sells uh, 30% and he still has 67%, has he changed control? And um, Tyler, has he changed control? So it's not every share you sell in an oil company that will require you to obtain the content of the minister. It is only when you sell the shares to an extent whereby you have ceded what? Control. So what is control? What is control? What is changing control? You still see that section 95. Changing control for this purpose means a situation when a person or persons acting jointly or in concert are able to acquire over 50 50% 50 of the voting power of the concession. So if you directly or indirectly, directly than the one buying. Indirectly is that I bought 15, my wife bought 10, my first son bought 10. Are you with me? They are all buying as my nominees through me. So by the time you join all I have bought with what my wife has bought and my children, it has exceeded 51%. Control has changed. It becomes illegal without the consent of the minister. Can we continue? Yes. That notwithstanding, please notice, that notwithstanding, in the course of operations, an oil company may have financial obligations and in order to meet them it may go to a bank to borrow money the bank will require from it a collateral or a pledge are you with me the law allows the law allows an oil company to pledge or collateralize its oil block by as a way of security but that will, can only be done with the consent of the minister of petroleum I mean the, the commission, the commission, not the minister. So here, you don't go to the minister, you go to the commission and say, I need $200 million to produce this field. First bank has agreed to give me, but I am pledging my stake in this joint venture. So let's assume Shell has 45% in OML 11. Shell can pledge it. For this purpose, the pledge is not an assignment because you have not transferred title. Title is retained with you, and the intention is that some at some point you'll be able to pay the money and then get back. Yes, beautiful. Can we continue, please? So, what is the procedure for consent? I already said that you apply for consent in the prescribed form, accompanied with any other relevant information, and that the minister, the commission will require upon which. The um, commission will make the recommendation to the minister, which must consider it, consider the recommendation, and cannot unreasonably withhold consent. If you must withhold consent, it must be with reason. 
where he consents, the commission will record and promptly notify the applicant. And uh, this must be done. Yeah, so it must, if the, the minister must respond again within 60 days. If he doesn't, it will be deemed that he has approved. Yeah. If he rejects, he must provide business. So, one of the things that led to this provision was a case. Our friend, our friend versus the Minister of Petroleum. Our friend. Thank you, Lord. Any wahala, any problem? Should I spell our friend? Yes. Okay, so take it first. Lek Oil, L E K O I L. Lek Oil Limited and Afrin Investment Oil and Gas Limited versus Minister of uh, Petroleum. Yes, somebody just check your WhatsApp. Are you all on WhatsApp? Yes. You have to be. Uh, so check your WhatsApp later. I have, I've given you that authority there. Good, so I've posted it already. So you see what happened was that there's a company called Lake Oil Limited that wanted to sell their shares or their stake in an oil block, I think, to Afrin. So they approached the Minister of Petroleum. Oh, God, please give us consent. He did not say yes, he did not say no for nearly two years. And so they now, they were, but during that period, um, our father, Buhari, traveled to. It's our father. Is it not our father? <laughs> father of the nation. Whether I like it or not, he has the power. So our father traveled out of the country and then his deputy, Yemi Osibanjo, issued an executive order. Are you with me? Yes. That order was to the effect that if you apply for, if you apply executive order, I've forgotten the number now, executive order for the ease of doing business, it was issued on the 18th of May 2017. Yes, so Yemi Osibanjo issued that order. The effect of that order is that if you apply for consent from any government official and you don't get approval within a particular time frame, it will be deemed what? Granted. And so let oil now argue that on the strength of that order, since we have been waiting for this <laughs> minister for two years, Tarela, can you imagine two years? I don't know if you can think of two years again. Two years. <laughs> Everything you are doing is kept on hold. You cannot go forward, you cannot go backward. That is that is how wicked government officials. <laughs> two years. And so since a super joy issued this order, they say, ah, thank God. Let us now deem it what granted. And so the matter goes to court. The federal court said no. The executive order does not have the force of law that can override that can override a statutory provision because the Petroleum Act and the schedule to the act, you know the schedule to the act is part of the act. Are you aware of that? Yes. You know that? Yes, yes the schedule. So just like the schedule is like a footnote. The schedule is not a subsidiary legislation. What is a subsidiary legislation? Give me an example. Kuro. Example of a subsidiary legislation. You are in trouble now that I've known your name. <laughs> you will not rest. Yes? Yes? My daughter, help us. Irregulation. Irregulation. So, yes, my son. Example. A rule. A rule is a social legislation. Example, rules of professional conduct. So, you know, the legislator, the legislature can confer lawmaking powers on an administrative and personality, like a minister, regulator, and all that. Very well, to make rules. But those rules are called subsidiary laws. They cannot override a substantive law that is made by the National Assembly. Even the president of Nigeria cannot give an order that overrides a law, an act of the National Assembly. So the issue now was this executive order that this man has issued. Yes, it's, it's a wonderful development, but it cannot override the provisions of the first schedule to the Petroleum Act. Are you with me? That says the minister must give what? Give what? Approval. And if he has not given for the next hundred years, it cannot, he has not given. So it was that defect that this PIA has now cured by saying 
60 days instead of two years, so the man will know what he's doing and all that. Are there questions, please? Good people, a good lecture. Thank you, Lord. So, like I said, if he rejects the and transfer the assignment, as the case may be, he must provide what reason. Not only will he provide reason, he will, he will now give the person that wants to transfer reasonable time to make the representation, either to defend himself, to explain himself, and you will consider that uh, representation. Are there questions? So remember the general rule, don't transfer, don't novate, don't assign your concession or any right power or interest in it. Similarly, a shareholder in an unincorporated joint venture, unincorporated joint venture, it's a sorry. Let me just confirm. It's not unincorporated, it's incorporated. When something is out of place, I didn't know. So a shareholder in an incorporated joint venture. I will talk about incorporated joint ventures when we get to the next topic. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Good. So you cannot also sell your shares without the uh, consent of this minister of uh, petroleum. Petroleum. Thank you, Lord. Now, in granting consent, the minister may require that certain terms and conditions be met. So before the minister will grant his consent to the transfer or the assignment, these are some things he wants to ensure. Number one is that the proposed transferee must be incorporated in Nigeria. The company you want to transfer these assets to must have been incorporated in Nigeria. So even if it's a foreign company coming into Nigeria, they have to go and register a subsidiary. So it's now Shell Nigeria or BP Nigeria, that's the first thing. Two, it must be of good reputation and standing. Good reputation and standing. Some companies don't have good reputation. Wherever they go, they ferment trouble. Some have terrible environmental uh, records. Some are known for com causing communal strife. Wherever they go, they enter a community in Niger Delta, they carry the chief, <laughs> chief from this village and chief from this village and knock they had that be said there was war, they had that name <laughs> You know, so it must have good reputation and what? And number two, it must have sufficient technical knowledge, experience and financial resources. My, my question to this is that if you must have technical uh, knowledge, experience and financial resources, are you saying a new company can never be granted an oil block? Because before you are granted, you must have experience, that's what they are saying. You know, so you must have technical knowledge, experience, and financial resources to enable you to effectively carry out responsibilities, blah, blah. It must comply, listen, it must comply with the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act. It must comply with the Federal Computer and Consumer Protection Act. The next one, the, the, you must have paid application, uh, applic uh, uh, application fees, of course, and those fees are not tax deductible. Note that you must pay application fees to the commission. So the commission may say, okay, you want to transfer your lease, pay one million dollars. You pay that one million dollars, and when it's time to pay tax, you cannot go and say that's one million I paid that time. Please give me tax relief. Let me deduct it for tax relief. That's what I'm saying. Lastly, there must be full disclosure of the details. There must be full disclosure of the details of the transfer or the transaction to FIRS. What, what is FIRS? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Now, nobody asked me why must it comply with the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act? Why? 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 Those are the things, uh, the questions students will ask, you know that this person is thinking. That requirement is, is inserted there to ensure, listen, to ensure that, because when two or more companies merge, it can lead to the creation of a monopoly. Is that not so? 
And when we have a monopoly, one of the things a monopolist can do is to introduce or to apply practices that will restrict trade. A monopolist can dominate a market and then consumers will suffer. So goods that probably, you know, competition brings out the best of everybody, is that not so? Yes. And for the most part, the, the, the beneficiaries of a competitive regime is the consumer. Because everybody is jostling to satisfy the consumer because they are all competing. And because they are all competing, they want to give their best. And so this one is offering you 10 naira, this one is offering you 8 naira, this one is offering you 7 naira. But if you have a monopolist, he has no competitor, and so he can tell you pay 100 naira or go anywhere you want to go to. That is what the law is now saying that. If we are going to transfer your concession, or if there is going to be a... I thought you were doing this course. Come. You have never entered this class before. Never forever. You are at what level? You used to do this course before. No. It's okay. You can go. So the whole idea is that if two or three companies are now merging, as a result of that merger, we now have one monopolist. Then he can sell a product for one million naira, and there's nothing else you can do. He has no competitors. So the law now says that before we will allow this transfer of merger, you must have submitted it to the federal character. There's a commission, federal and competition character commission. And all that. So it's a body now. Are you with me? Yes. That body would have now assessed it to say it does not have what you call a trade distorting effect. The effect of this measure or the effect of this transfer will not distort free trade. So go ahead. Good. Any questions? Madam, I hope you're not reading uh, your phone. No phone reading in my class. Okay, thank you, Lord. So we'll look at revocations. And uh, no, let's look at surrender first. No, leave surrender. I think uh, I'm still cooking that food. There are some details I need to add. So next time we meet, we'll look at relinquishment and surrender. Is that okay? Yes. I already explained that relinquishment is that you are giving up some parts. And then uh, surrender, you are giving up everything. Yes, so there's, a, there's what they call voluntary relinquishment and then there's what they call uh, compulsory relinquishment but there are some details I still want to um, perfect before I will come to the class. So let's use the next 30 minutes and see what we can do with revocation. Revocation. Yeah, so this is section 96. This is section 96 of the Act. Yeah. So you can look up now. Now a license or a lease or an authorization is granted to you. It's not, it's not an automatic right. It's granted to you based on the fulfillment of certain conditions. The moment those conditions are no longer in existence. The person that granted you that license will be able to withhold it or revoke it from you. So if uh, a right of occupancy, for example, is given to you by the government, they could say, use this land, it's a residential area. Is that not so? If you use that land and you begin to harbor kidnappers, one of the things the governor can do is to revoke your right of occupancy. So we've had instances, particularly in the east, in the eastern part of Nigeria, where they discovered that this, this house has been used for kidnapping purposes. 
The governor goes there with bulldozers and bulldoze the house. Revoke the occupancy. Whether it is customary or what? Or what? Eh? Statutory. So we have the statutory right of occupancy. You know, you know that now? Yes. Then you have the customary rights. Then we used to have what they call the deemed right of occupancy. Sections what? Deemed right of occupancy. Sections what? Eh? You don't know. I almost through it first semester. Deemed right of occupancy. Sections 34, section 36 of the Land Act. You should read, see. You are, I don't know what you do, what you're doing, but you are doing land law. You are young people. And your major document, at least for now, is the Land Use Act. There are a number of other laws as well. But the main thing you are looking at is the Land Use Act. 50 something, 50 something sections. You know, 51 or 52 sections. Eh? The first thing you will do, if you know what you are doing, in one sitting you will cover that law. Just read it. Glance through. Then take your time. You go through it again. You go through it. Once you have, you, you have put the law in your head, 52 sections, you already. Any other thing the lecturer is not teaching and the cases he's citing, they're just to strengthen and to give flesh to this skeleton. So you already have the structure. So try your best. <laughs> you are doing a sale of goods, 52 or 53 sections. I'm just giving you an example now. You're year three now. You go through it. Very straightforward. You come to company law now. It uh, <laughs> 870 sections. You sit down first and you read everything. Are you with me? You go through it once. Go through it twice. Go through it the third time. Then you are ready. That is how you, you have to make it. And don't say it's too big. It's too, you are very young people. You have capacity. You are just putting yourself. Okay. Thank you, Father. So now, I, I said all of that to say this, that rights granted can be what? Revoked. Particularly where conditions where they are granted based on your fulfillment of certain conditions and there are a number of them. The person that has been given the oil block has to be paying in tax to government. Because for the government, I told you most development, developing countries, they benchmark their budget to the price of petroleum. So they are dependent on that petroleum. So you are not producing it, you are not paying us. That one, they don't even think at twice, just revoke it. Then we have environmental considerations. The government, like Nigeria, will not take environment as seriously as if you take money. But a country like Norway, or a Western country where they take environment like anything, you are found to have released some hazardous material into the sea. That can be a ground for reputation. You know, so there are a number of these grounds. So we'll go through them and see and the procedure. Is that okay? Yes. Good. So first thing I want to just emphasize is that all concessionary rights, including petroleum exploration, exploration licenses, may be revoked by the minister in certain instances. This cannot be done arbitrarily, but it must be done upon the recommendation again of who? Of the commission. So again, it's not an arbitrary act. You cannot wake up and say, our brother in the river state of my, of my governor here some weekend, there was this man that uh, called this called Senator Lee Meba. Senator Lee Meba. <laughs> the whole of them used to dance together, eat pepper soup together. But Lee Meba now is supporting Atiku. He goes to television and is insulting the governor. The governor said, hey, you don't know that I'm very powerful. Quickly just revoked his land. That is what they call arbitrary word revocation. And nobody should have such powers. The absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Yes. Nobody should have it. Just remove, just make up and revoke it. You know. So the lawyer is saying you can't do that arbitrarily. It must be done on the fulfillment of certain uh, conditions or grounds. One reason again why you even, as far as oil and gas is concerned, why you can't even do it arbitrarily again is because you know that we are highly dependent on foreign capital to explore and produce our oil. You are aware of that? Yes, and foreign technology. If these investors discover that as a government you have uh, you are very volatile in your policy policy decision, they will not come. They will allow you to leak your oil. And you know you, that's it. 
you can't lift it because you don't have the capacity. They won't come. So every serious government endeavors to make its terrain an uh, attractive investment and destination. Are you with me? So one of the things they do when they globe trot, when the president globe trots and they say, Oh God, president, you stay and govern us. Six weeks you travel, you just came from Egypt. Now you're in Nigeria, now you're in UN. What he will tell you is that he's looking for foreign what? Investments. So he goes to China, he goes to a trade uh, and Congress, a trade welfare, whatever. And uh, what do they call it? A trade fair. He goes to a trade fair. Nigeria is good. In fact, there's no security problem in Nigeria. They say, what well, we heard about uh, kidnapping in Boko Haram. Yes, that was in the that was in the past. So he goes to market his country. Now, a foreign investor that is going to come, one of his his concerns should be how stable is this government in terms of policy decision. And are you with me? And so if they discover that you have an arbitrary system where I can plow hundreds of millions of dollars and without without winking you can just revoke it, then they won't come. And so one of the things we have tried to do by enacting this PIA is to give the international community an impression that we are now what serious to subscribe to the rule of law. And so the Minister of Petroleum, I said all of that to say this cannot revoke your concession arbitrarily. First of all, there must be a recommendation from civil servants, the commission, public servants, and these are technical experts. In addition to that, the following grounds must be fulfilled. And so you can challenge the decision again in court. Challenge it in court, the court can now exercise its uh, mandamus, and prerogative, those are prerogative rights. Who did that mean lawyer? Manda Mus, what is the other one? Setura rights and all that. Now what for now? Abyss Kofu. Abyss Kofu. Abyss Kofu is when you detain somebody. Yes. Good. Okay, let's move on. So some of the ground. Number one, failure to conduct petroleum operations in accordance with good international industry practices. The PIA and other relevant legislation. That is the first ground. You fail to conduct your operations in accordance with good international and uh, industry practices. So now, for the petroleum industry, we have what we call standards. Some of these standards have international uh, recognition. One of the most popular ones is called the API, American Petroleum uh, Institute. Are you with me? Yes. API. So they they issue standards that oil companies are uh, required to comply with in carrying out their operations. We also have a European standard as well. Okay, so let's just leave it at API for now. So now Assuming that a company now carries out its operations without complying with these standards, these standards are geared towards sustainability and ensuring that uh, you apply good oil field practice to prevent leakages, to prevent uh, damage to the environment and all that. Failure to comply therefore becomes a ground for revocation. Second one, uh, if, the, if you interrupt production for over 100 and 80 consecutive days without justification. You understand? Yes. Yes, as provided for in the applicable license or lease or approved FDP. So you have not been producing. That means you are not serious. Of course, you could have a defense of what forced majority. But apart from those kind of defenses, you have to be producing daily because we are benchmarking our budget. Don't forget, we are benchmarking, benchmarking our budget to daily production. And so if you fail to produce, then okay, it's time for us to say bye-bye. Also, failure to fulfill the terms and conditions of the applicable concession or approved FDP. Failure to pay rents, royalties, and taxes are registered. That. Failure to furnish any report or data on operations as required by law is also a ground. Another one is assigning, novating, or transferring your interest without obtaining consent. It's another ground under which you can be revoked. Then, then this is a new one. This is a new one. Where the concession was obtained was obtained based on false representation or in violation to anti-corruption laws, bribery and corruption. 
you know, so if we later discover that you obtain the conception based on false representation or in a, yeah, so it becomes a ground. What is the problem now? Okay. Is this still on? Yes. Excellent. The next, or the other one is bankruptcy, insolvency, or liquidation. So if the company becomes bankrupt or insolvent or is liquidated, it is a ground for which we can also revoke. Note, however, that note, however, that if the insolvency occurs by virtue of a corporate reorganization mechanism, if the company is liquidated by virtue of a corporate reorganization mechanism it will not be a ground to revoke it. So company A and company B may want to merge and then uh, company A may agree with company B to transfer all its assets to company B and then be dissolved, be liquidated. That liquidation is not what you call an insolvent liquidation. An insolvent liquidation is a liquidation that arises because you have become so indebted to third parties you are not, not able to pay them. You are insolvent, you are bankrupt. Bankruptcy becomes a ground for revocation because if you are bankrupt, definitely you will not be able to carry out your obligations. Please point that out, note that out. Failure to comply with environmental obligations, gas flaring, environmental management plan, and decommissioning and all that. We'll talk about it as we continue. Or where the concession is wholly or partly owned or controlled by a former or serving public official, this is pure corruption who obtained his interest in violation of the law, it may also be revoked. Uh, Minister, for, uh, Minister for Petroleum now uses his wire to give it to his uh, sister or a director in Ministry of uh, Petroleum and all that. Failure to submit an advance and FDP and work commitment to the commission where the company failure to the next one failure to initiate regular and commercial production within the development period and lastly failure where the, you cease to pay where you cease to produce sorry in pain and quantities procedure before revoking the commission must notify you again you cannot wake up and hear that they have revoked the concession that cannot happen anymore. No, uh, cannot happen. Politicians can do that to their political opponents, but you can't do this in this law. You must first of all notify the person. The commission will write to you and give you grounds. Number two, they will give you 60 days to remedy the situation. 60 days. It's when you fail to do that that uh, they can terminate. Note, however, that termination the revocation will not will be without uh, prejudice to your earlier obligations. They have revoked your concession, but before they revoked it, you were owing somebody. Are you with me? So revocation is without prejudice to any liability obligation which the concessionaire may have incurred in favor of the commission, command, government, or any other third party. It is also without prejudice to any claim which the government or the commission or any third party may have against him. Good. What next? Okay, I'll end with this. Upon revocation, the revocation will be published in the Gazette and the Commission will after that amend all its relevant registers to reflect it. The PML will therefore vest, the concession will vest in the government and will be administered by the Commission. Subsequently, it will be granted for another company after the conduct of a successful bidding round. Okay, basically that, that, that. So we'll stop here. Is that okay? Yes. When we meet next week, by the grace of God, that should be Tuesday. When we meet on Tuesday, please listen. We'll look at relinquishment, we'll look at surrender. And then we'll look at transitional provisions. Transitional provisions. We'll also look at conversion. Conversion of OPL to uh, OM, PPL and OML to what? PML. We'll look at some of that. 
Then, uh, God willing, we'll look at the law on unitization. We'll look at the law relating to marginal oil fields. And uh, we'll look at extensions and renewals. And lastly, God willing, we'll look at the law on frontier business. Is that okay? Yeah. So please, this course is very important. And uh, I want you people to learn it. Come on, also. Learn it very, very well because you can make a lot of money after now. We don't have many, many. Mm -hmm. You can off it, my son. <laughs> <laughs>